Okay, uh, that allowed a couple more people to come in, so that's excellent. Um, thank you, Elizabeth, for agreeing to give uh, this, I'm sure gonna be an absolutely fascinating presentation. And thank you everybody for joining us. Um, Elizabeth Price uh, is a certified master gardener since 2008 and has been leading workshops on conifers for other master gardeners and for uh, the public for over a decade. Uh, the interest in conifers led to her writing a book on the subject, uh, which was just published in the fall by Oregon State University Press. Um, Elizabeth also has taken uh, all the photographs in the book. Um, she holds an MFA in creative writing from the University of Arizona and has worked as a professional writer, editor, and curriculum designer. And in the upcoming CQ, you'll be able to see um, uh, uh, some of her work. Uh, she has written a fantastic article on identifying seers. Um, so we're looking forward to everybody seeing that. And um, Elizabeth, it's all yours. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Jeff. Thank you for inviting me to give this talk. I'm very happy to do so. Um, I love talking about conifers, particularly to conifer crazy people. <laughs> Sometimes if you're talking to sort of people who are meh about conifers, you know, they, they don't get it as much, but uh, it's nice to be, you know, among my own kind. Um, so today I'm going to talk about Arbavati and uh, conifers that look like Arbavati. So Thuya is the Arbavati genus, um, and but there are other uh, conifers that look a great deal like them and can be very difficult to differentiate between. And so I'm going to talk about this entire group of conifers that all have uh, the same kind of foliage. They all have flattened scales. Um, uh, and one of these you can see in the picture here is the or oriental arbor body, which is very easy to identify. It's not one of the difficult ones to identify. The, these arianenas, which I like to show pictures of because they're so spectacular. Um, they used to be in the Thuya genus. They used to be in the arbor body genus, but they have been given uh, their own genus because it was determined they were unique enough. Um, so platycladus was uh, created for them. and. Uh, these specimens you're looking at are at a, a pioneer cemetery north of Portland, um, that it, a cemetery that dates back to before the um, before 1900. And uh, these Orianana, the Orianana cultivar was registered in France in uh, 1867. So, uh, given the fact that these specimens you're looking at are 14 feet tall and at least 10 feet wide, I mean they could very easily be a hundred years old. And they're just, um, it's a very special place there. You can see how they planted them in couplets down a row like this, and they're protected because they're in a cemetery. If you were to see what's going on across the street here, you would see uh, the housing development, the big you know, growth boom that's happening in Portland is pressing down on this area. And uh, just very glad that they're in a cemetery and will be protected for posterity. And um, of course, cemeteries are great places to go find old, beautiful conifer specimens because um, they are protected from development and redevelopment or the taste of a new homeowner, you know, who maybe maybe doesn't like something that the previous owner planted. Um, and of course, in England, uh, the, the English yews, all of the ancient English yews are found in churchyards. All of the other ones have been harvested hundreds of years ago. So churchyards and cemeteries and graveyards are great places to experience old conifers. Um, but before we get into the nitty gritty of identifying arborvita, I wanted to um, just talk about, uh, take a global look at the foliage in the Cypress family so we have some context. So uh, the group that we're gonna be looking at today is here on the left um, and they have scale-like foliage that is flattened. Um, and this is why they are difficult to differentiate between because they do have all have this very similar flattened foliage. Um, rounded scales is another type of foliage you find in the cypress family, and all cypresses uh, have this foliage as well as many junipers. And then the other two types of foliage you see in the cypress family are awls and, and linear foliage. Uh, all like foliage um, is also found in junipers. Some junipers have all rounded scales, some junipers have all alls, and some have a combination of the two. Uh, Cryptomeria also have alls, the Japanese cedar 
sequoia dendron, sequoia dendron uh, the giant sequoia has all, and of course, um, the juvenile foliage of all species in the cypress family is all like before transitioning into whatever is uh, typical for the species. And as we all know, there are many, many uh, cultivars that capture, that have that fixed juvenile foliage for the life um, of the plant. Um, and the linear foliage over here is um, what I would say is the exception uh, in the cypress family. Uh, all of these plants here uh, that have this linear foliage it used to be in a different plant family, it used to be in the Taxodiaceae family, the bald cypress family. And they were moved into the cypress family because um, of similarities in the cones and through DNA testing. But the, it's interesting because this is a very interesting group of conifers because they're all adapted to very wet uh, environment. Uh, of course, uh, the bald cypress grows in water and the dawn redwood uh, in, it, in its native area in China where it was discovered is riparian, but in, 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 its, in the past history of this uh, species, the dawn redwood, when it was more predominant across the planet, it grew in swampy areas as well. And the glyptostrobus is, also grows in swamps. And although the coast redwood doesn't grow in wet areas, it does uh, tolerate uh, being inundated by water. Um, and in fact, I saw one recently along the coast, uh, not far, you know, to go straight from Portland to the coast, I saw one growing in, a, in, in water. I was trying to get a picture of it and I went up to my mid calf in water and it was very interesting looking because it had a big swollen base and had adapted to that environment and had a big swollen base. So they, they are very tolerant of wet um, and uh, they are considered, um, you know, they were adapted to the planet when it was much wetter and warmer and like the scale-like foliage that you see uh, in um, you know, like the cypresses is an adaptation to drier conditions. So these are these are some of the oldest conifers that we have. I also just wanted to take a, a global look at the cones uh, of the cypress family uh, becoming these three basic uh, shapes. Uh, what we're gonna be looking at today will be flower bud and soccer ball shaped. Um, uh, and also the cones are, compared to cones in the pine family, they're much smaller. Uh, they tend to be flower bud shaped or soccer ball shaped. Uh, we'll be looking at the fall cypresses today, the chemisypris, uh, they have uh, soccer ball shaped uh, cones like the cypress genus, although the ones in the cypress genus tend to be a lot, larger and not always perfectly round. And we'll also be looking at uh, this hybrid genus of the Leland cypress. And of course, everyone's familiar with the beautiful berry like cones of uh, the junipers. So um, far less diversity in cones in the cypress family than in the pine family, you know, um, where there are many species in the pine family where, you know, you have a cone, you can go directly to the species. And that's true for some species in the cypress family as well, but it's much, much less common. Okay, so these are the species that we're gonna be looking at today and they all have this flattened scale foliage. Uh, we'll be looking first at the thuyas, which are the true arborvita, and then at the uh, Camerociparus, three Camerociparus species, which uh, look the most like the thuyas. Um, and this is the false cypress genus. We'll also be looking at incense cedar, the Leland cypress, um, the staghorn cedar, and of course, as I mentioned before, the platycladus, if we have time at the very end, we'll look at some of its features. Um, and it used to be in the Thuya genus, so it's sort of like a, still an honorary Thuya, you know, um, at least I think of it that way. Um, and these are the first conifers I fell in love with. <laughs> when I um, started getting into this subject 12 years ago, I meet with uh, a group of master gardeners twice a month. Uh, we're called the, uh, the Master Gardener Study Group, and we take turns leading sessions on different topics of interest. And this was one of the first sessions that I ever led uh, on, was on um, this group of conifers. And um, here in uh, the Northwest, we have a great diversity of native conifers um, that are in the native forest, but they're also seeding down all the time. I mean, I just yesterday or a few days ago, I pulled up four Western red cedar seedlings growing under my uh, hillside creeper Scots pine. They're just they just come up wherever they want, and um, and also other 
uh, conifers also sort of seed down, some that are native to the Pacific Northwest, but aren't necessarily native to, to you know, right here in the Willamette Valley, you know, the incense cedar, which is native to, you first start seeing it in central Oregon, and south of there, seeds down very readily here. And so does the uh, Port Orford cedar, which is of course native to a small portion of Southwest Oregon and Northwest California, uh, seeds down very readily. So uh, my house here backs up to a, a, a very large native forest fragment. And um, I see all these Western red cedars growing out outside my window here. And there's another one, but somehow there is a, a Port Orford cedar growing in and amongst all of these Western red cedars, which is what you would expect to find, you know, um, but so it makes conifer ID particularly challenging here. <laughs> um, and particularly for master gardeners who are being presented by the public with samples that could be a native conifer, it could be a, an ornamental conifer planted, it could be a conifer that's seeded down and uh, resources you know, tend to, identification resources tend to focus either on ornamental plants or a native conifers. And so I initially made these charts to um, help master gardeners you know, identify conifers in this in a setting where they're all growing together, um, where we have all these native ones and all these ornamental ones kind of all mixed together. And uh, so these were the very first charts I made. This is, you know, uh, the, an earlier version was the first one. Um, and you see that in, in the pine family, uh, foliage sorts very tidily by genus. So, you know, all pines, you know, have fascicles, all spruce needles have pegs. And so, you have something you know that is specific just to that genus, but in the cypress family, it's it's different than that. You know, here we have five genera and one hybrid genus that have all the same type of foliage, and so it makes this particular group conifers perhaps the most difficult in the of all the conifers I think to identify. Um, and this is the one I started with. These are the ones I fell in love with first. And so we're going to look at these nine conifers here today, and at close-up images of so many of these thumbnails you're seeing here. And these are typical in the book. There's maybe almost 50 pages of charts like this in the book. Um, so we will start with the Thuya genus, uh, the Arborvita genus, uh, true Arborvita genus. Uh, Thuya placata, the western red cedar, um, is a beautiful long-lived uh, Pacific Northwest native tree that is found from uh, the Alaska Panhandle all the way into Northern California. And you also see it in the Cascades <clears throat> here in Oregon and Washington, and in, I believe in British Columbia as well. Um, Lewis and Clark uh, navigated up the Missouri River and had to ditch their boats and then cross the Rocky Mountains. And when they did, they were very lucky to find the Western Red Cedar growing <laughs> right there where they came out of the mountains and they, made uh, large trees into boats that they navigated onto the Pacific Ocean. Um, and if you look, if you want to develop your skills of, of being able to identify some of these trees just by form and by look as you're driving by in your car, one thing to note is the branch ends. In, in a Western Ridge Cedar, the branch ends arch up like this. And we will see in other conifers that we'll look at today, different characteristics at the branch end. So they have this upswept look at the ends like that, which is uh, unique to unique in this group of conifers to the Western Red Cedar. Um, uh, and here is the Western Red Cedar foliage. Uh, and I wanna talk about uh, in detail here, the features of this type of foliage. Um, each one of these scales here, there's one, two, three that you can look at in this, this grouping uh, is a leaf, a reduced leaf. And these leaves form pairs. This is uh, like the lateral pair of scales and there's a facial, it's called a facial pair. There's this one and there's a, a corresponding one on the other side of the foliage. And these scales have features to them that uh, help you differentiate between this group of conifers. So, and the, the, these scales here are folded in the long direction. So they're folded in half. And these scales here are, are flattened in the wide direction. And this pair kind of wraps around that, the facial pair. And uh, what's different from species to species and genus to genus is uh, the shape of the peak of the scales, this, the apex 
uh, it's, it's pointed in uh, Western Ridge Cedar and in others it's rounded. And we'll, we'll see other examples as we go through. And another thing to note is how, how well the, the peaks line up. They don't quite line up perfectly in uh, Western Ridge Cedar, but um, we'll see that this is pretty straight compared to other, other conifers that we'll look at. Um, another thing to note is uh, the pattern of these stomata. Uh, stomata are openings in the leaf surface, typically clustered on the underside, that allow for carbon dioxide and oxygen to pass in and out of the leaf. And uh, although you can't see the openings themselves, they have this waxy coating that uh, reflects light and keeps the air temperature down on the leaf surface. Uh, and they form patterns. Um, and some, some conifers like the Western Red Cedar, they form distinctive patterns. That, this is typically described as a butterfly pattern. It looks more like cat eyes to me. And, um, and some conifers will not have any pattern. That's also a character, also something to note. So when you look at this unit, what I think of as a unit of fo foliage, these two, two pairs of scales, you know, those are all attributes that help you tell you what genus you're in and what um, species you're looking at. Um, and of course, uh, the foliage of Western red cedar is very beautiful, braided looking as you, as you sort of step back from it a little bit. Um, and if, uh, particularly as we get older, sometimes a, a loop is very helpful for seeing some of these uh, um, features. Uh, sometimes they can be a little difficult to see with the naked eye. And I, uh, I use a 10X loop uh, I carry with me, you know, whenever I'm outside and it, it very much comes in handy and it can make these, this kind of level of detail a lot easier to see. And uh, these are the female seed cones of the Thuya plicata. Um, and these cones uh, are the same across the genus. So all species in Thuya pretty much have the same cone. It's not, it's not in the same place on the tree, but they have the same cone and it's yellow when it's young. And it, I, I mean, it's, it ages from green to this yellow and then to this brown. Um, and they set a lot of cones and they uh, hold onto them for a long period of time. Just Looking out my window here, I see it. I can see three seasons of uh, cones on that tree, you know, easily. So you're, you're pretty much going to have a cone um, when you're looking at, at a Western Red Cedar. You won't have to search for them. Uh, and they're small, they're just about a, up to a half an inch long. Um, so now I want to just move on to the other, uh, excuse me, um, conifer in this genus that we see. Uh, in North America, um, the Eastern white cedar. And the, emerald, the species is almost never grown ornamentally. Um, and of course, emerald green is something that we see over and over and over again. Um, but the, the foliage of most cultivars is the same as the emerald, emerald green. Um, is If you were to uh, put it in your hand and feel it between your fingers, you would notice how thin it is. And if you were to take your other hand and feel the foliage of all the other ones that we're gonna talk about today, you would, you would see that it is, it is the thinnest um, and uh, almost paper thin. Uh, and it has the same cones as the Western Red Cedar. I also wanna talk a little bit about the naming. So this is Thuya occidentalis, uh, which means Western, and, but the common name is Eastern White Cedar. Um, and this is Thuya occidentalis as compared with the Thuya orientalis, which is now the platycladus orientalis, that um, the eastern arb eastern arborvitae. So this is occidentalis as opposed as the western hemisphere, as opposed to Thuya orientalis, which is the eastern hemisphere, Asia. But its common name, eastern white cedar, refers to the eastern United States, as opposed to the western red cedar, which is in the western United States. So. These, the, the naming in the Cypress family is very confounding uh, and it off, often doesn't match up like that. And it can make these names hard to keep straight. I even have a hard time keeping these straight. Um, but I just wanted to mention that if you're wondering why it was Eastern in the common name and Western in the, in the botanical name. Um, and this is also uh, where the genus got its name, Arbovitae, Tree of Life. Um, uh, in 15, the winter of 1565, I believe it was 1535, uh, 
the French explorer Jacques Cartier was overwintering in Eastern Canada and his crew was dying off from scurvy. And a local uh, Iroquois Indian shared with him their remedy for scurvy, which they also had trouble with. And they took the foliage of the occidentalis and they would boil it. And then they would drink the tea, like drink the water that it had been boiled in. And it was a, a very good cure for scurvy. Um, and uh, it has the foliage by weight has more vitamin C than oranges, which of course is why the deer eat this as winter forage because during a time of year where there's very little fresh produce for them to eat. So that is supposedly where the, where the term tree of life came for this, uh, from that uh, saving the lives of Cartier and the rest of his crew that winter in 1535. So if we were to compare Western red cedar and Eastern white cedar foliage side by side, you would see that uh, this two pair of um, the scales uh, are very similarly shaped. They both have that um, apex on the scale, on top of the scale, but the, the, and that the only real difference is that this one on the right here, the Eastern white cedar does not have uh, any stomatal markings and this one on, on the left does. And that's how you, you would differentiate between these two if you, just had a, <clears throat> if you just had a small foliage sample. Obviously, you could differentiate them by other means like by form, but if you were just, someone slapped down a foliage sample and said, what is this? Uh, first, you would say by the shape that you would know it's a uh, aptilia, and then by the, whether it had markings or not, stomatal markings or not, you would know whether it's a Western red cedar or uh, an eastern white cedar. So, um, so you see what what these samples have in common as a genus, and what they, they and how they they differentiate as species. Um, okay, now we're going to move on to the uh, Camarcyparis uh, genus, the false cypress genus. Um, and the port, we'll start with the Port Orford cedar. Uh, this is a, a species endemic to a very restricted area of Southwest Oregon and Northwest California, uh, one of the rarest conifers on the planet in the wild. Um, it is tolerant of the very poor soil that is, even toxic soil that is found in that little restricted area um, where there are, I think, 280 endemic plants um, right there in that part of uh, Southwest Oregon and Northwest California. Unfortunately, it is susceptible to root rot that was introduced uh, in the Seattle area, I think in the 1920s, and it moved its way south in ornamental plantings, and then from there jumped into the native population where it is now rampant. And OSU um, is working on uh, developing resistant, um, those that are, are resistant and are, are now involved in a long-term planting program down there. Um, and if you were to look, if we were to compare the form of this tree to the form of um, Western red cedar, which it very much resembles, uh, if you recall a, a Western red cedar, the, the branches are gonna arch up at the end and uh, Port Orford, they're gonna just nod. They just gently nod at the end. And when they have a lot of cones on them, they're gonna nod more dramatically. But that is, if you were just to look at the form, in what, as you drove by, how would you tell what it is? Um, that would be a clue there, just that those nodding branches at the end. Beautiful tree, very popular tree in Asia. Okay, now we're gonna do a close up of the foliage. Um, in the Camarcyparis genus, uh, the unit of foliage, uh, these four scales, they form an expat pattern. And that is true of all the species in this genus. So that is something that can tell you that you're in the uh, Hemicyprus genus. Uh, and you can see in the case of the Port Orford cedar, the tips are rounded as opposed to, to like the Western red cedar where they were pointy and that they don't line up at all here. There, there's a, quite a bit of separation between the peak of this facial pair and the peak of the lateral pair. Um, and then uh, in, this species, you can see that the stomata form along that uh, decreases, forming a beautiful X pattern, highlighting that X pattern. And that's, a, that's an indication that it's a Port Orford cedar. 
excuse me. So if you're familiar with the Van Pelt's blue cultivar, which is very, very beautiful blue foliage, and you were to look at it, look at it carefully, you would see that the Van Pelt's blue has stomata all over the, scattered all over the surface, which gives you um, that beautiful blue color. But you would still know it's a Port Orford cedar because it would have the rounded, the rounded uh, apices like this and that did not line up. And uh, it would still have the X pattern, which would tell you you were in uh, the Chemiciparous genus. Uh, and here you see is a close up of a, the nodding branch, um, which is very different from the red cedar, which ar arches up at the end like that. We go on to Camerciparous cones. Um, Camerciparous, all the cones in this genus are these, what, what is described as like little soccer balls. Uh, the Port Alford cedar are, are up to only about a third inch, a third of an inch, but they're um, very, uh, they, they set them in quite a lot, of, a lot, a great number. So you probably will always have a cone. It's kind of uh, ages from this little cabbagey looking thing to something with a lot of purple in it to brown. And there are characteristics to look for that will tell you what species you're, you are having Cabociparis. So um, the details you want to look at is uh, the shape of the edge of the scale. You see how very wavy it is on this species. It's going to be different than the other species that we look at. And you also want to see each scale has a, a slight protrusion on it. Not very dramatic, but slight. That also tells you it's a Port Orford cedar cone. Um, and also it's it's one of these species that seeds down very, very readily. It sets a lot of cones and um, for some reason, even though it's very, very rare in the wild outside of its native range where it's planted, it will seed down right around like this tree right here, uh, which is not far from here at a local community college. In the spring, there's you know hundreds and hundreds of them seeding down and there's all these little uh, Port Orford seeders in all different stages of development on the ground. It's a really a fun place to go to see them at all different stages. Now we're gonna go on to the uh, Alaska cedar, uh, Chemociparis nutcatensis. Um, there's a lot of discussion about where this conifer belongs, what genus it belongs in. Uh, some people put it in one called Xan Xanthocyparis, and then some people put it in Calotropsis. Uh, some people think it should be in the Cypress genus. Uh, uh, it's, uh, there is no consensus yet, and I keep it in Chemociparis because that's uh, a lot of, mostly how it's it's sold in the in the horticultural trade but you know it will be moved around into a different genus eventually um, and it is a, a very dominant coastal species here on the west coast from Alaska all the way down to British Columbia uh, but also found inland further south in the Cascades here in Oregon and Washington and in BC um, you can see Alaska cedar and red cedar growing together here in Oregon up up by Mount Hood, you know, um, where sort of the two ranges overlap as it's getting a little at the, the, the highest elevation that red cedar goes and the kind of the lowest elevation that the uh, Alaska, Alaska cedar goes. You can see them kind of growing side by side, which is it's kind of nice. And uh, uh, this species is very tolerant of poor, poor soil. Um, in coastal areas of like Alaska and BC, where you know they get an astonishing amount of rain every year, the soil depletes. You know all the the elements are, are drained out of the upper layers of the soil and concentrated in a toxic layer lower down. So it is adapted to this sort of poor toxic soil, um, and it's of course known for its drooping habit. If you look, looking at the branch ends of uh, the Alaska cedar, they droop down very dramatically at the end. That's how you on a drive-by, we know it's Alaska cedar, or cedar. And of course, there's many, many cultivars that accentuate this, uh, this feature even more. Um, it's a great effect. Um, like I said, that's an adaptation for shedding snow where they get a lot of snow, particularly up in Alaska. Um, but the tree is uh, suffering in certain parts of its native range, particularly in coastal Alaska where the snow is melting earlier in the spring and leaving the roots exposed. Um, and then of course, uh, 
a very cold storm come does come through and the roots freeze and it, many trees are dying uh, because of uh, the lack of snow melt, lack of snow in spring when cold weather does come through because that snow is insta very insulating and prevents the roots from freezing. So um, there was ongoing studies going on about that and hopefully hopefully you can adapt to it, you know. Okay, here's the, a close up of the foliage of the Alaska cedar. Um, again, it's very droopy hab habit, not just at the branch ends, but the, the branches themselves, the branchlets, they just hang straight down without any lift whatsoever. Um, that's something else that differentiates it from some others. Uh, the, uh, the Western red cedar, you know, they actually drape, they, they hang down, but they actually haven't draped them. And then the Port Orford cedar, the um, the branchlets are much much smaller and the, uh, much more uh, um, graceful and gentle uh, than than this, which is just sort of like you know it's like it's been ironed. Um, and if we look uh, at a close up of this group of um, scales here, you see that it still form the forms an X where they meet, but there has no stomatal markings at all, and so that would tell you. Um, first of all, you know you're in Camerociparis because it forms this X, but the lack of stomata tells you it's Alaska cedar and also how very pointy the apices are and that they don't match up. So uh, all three of those things, and I'll, I'll show a comparison in a minute, you know, tell you that you're uh, one in Camerociparis and two, what species you have, the pointy tips and the, and the lack of stomata. And here are the seed cones of the Alaska cedar. So they have an extraordinarily uh, a pronounced um, horn on every, on every uh, scale. And the scale edge is somewhat wavy. So much less wavy than the uh, Port Orford cedar, but a much greater ho size horn than the Port Orford cedar. And they also get some purple in them sometimes. They age from green to uh, yellow to this caramel color. Um, and another thing that differentiates the Alaska cedar is it takes two growing seasons for the cone to mature, which is different than all the other ones that we'll look at today. And it is an argument, one of the arguments that it belongs in the cypress genus because cypress cones also take two seasons to um, mature. And another thing, uh, argument that people make is that it hybridizes with other conifers in the cypress genus. And it is, uh, although not rare for conifers to hybridize it, uh, within a genus, it is rare for a conifer to hybridize with a, another conifer in a different genus. And the Alaska cedar does that fairly readily. One of the results is the Leland cypress, of course. But uh, those are two arguments that, that botanists make for, for moving this. Um, Although I can't say I would like, I don't think it belongs in the Cypress genus. I'm not sure where it belongs, but um, you know, there's a lot of arguments uh, for doing so. Uh, the next one we're going to look at is the Hinoki uh, Cypress. The species is rarely or if never planted outside of, uh, um, you know, uh, like arboretums and things like that. Uh, native to Japan and Taiwan, I, I'm showing the gracilis here. And uh, in terms of comparing habits, and most of the cultivars are, are like this, is they're very open habit and they tend to, the, the foliage tends to die out in the middle there. Um, but if we were to look at the foliage, it's one of its characteristics is that it's twisted and cupped like this. Um, and, it's, and it's more congested than the other species that we looked at in Camerociparis, but you can still see, even though it's not quite as interesting, it's forming an X pattern there that tells you it's in Camerociparis. And some, uh, stoma, some of the scales will have stomata, some of them won't. And, but you'll also see that it's not, um, it's not really pointy like uh, the Alaska cedar and nor is it uh, um, uh, rounded. So it's something in between there. Um, and its cones, they also set lots of cones. You see that the scale edge in this case is very sharp. It looks like it's been cut with a knife. Uh, that's particular too. And you can even see as it's maturing, you can see that 
very clean line of the scale edge, and it has moderate horns. So those two features will tell you that um, that you have a Hinoki cypress. Uh, and if we were to look at them side by side, you can really see this pretty clearly. You see, you know, a very wavy edge, a somewhat wavy edge, straight edge here, uh, you have a moderate horn, a very pronounced horn, and you have a, um, well, this is, I would say, a very slight horn, a pronounced horn, and a moderate horn. So you can just see that those two features are what differentiate the cones in this genus. Um, and if we do a side by side comparison of the foliage, you can see, you know, rounded tips, the pointy tips, and you know, somewhat pointy tips here. Um, and that the scales don't line up really in any of them, maybe somewhat here over in the Hinoki Cypress, but that they all make that X pattern, you know, that lets you know you're in the in the camera cypress genus. A hand lens is helpful. <laughs> okay, so and I want to just I've been talking about the branch ends and how how you can uh, identify something as you're driving by. And I think in in regards to form, these are the three three uh, more difficult ones to differentiate among. And as I said, so you look at the look at the branches, particularly midway up the tree, and you'll see western red cedars just swoop up like in a, in a crooked smile like this. Alaska cedars will droop down. And then the Port Orford cedars with their, their nice little, how, how much smaller the fronds are here on the Port Orford cedar than they are on than these other two. And that's why there's not all that drape. They just sort of nod. It's a very nice, simple gesture. So um, uh, on a drive by, these would be the characteristics you'd want to look for. Okay, so now we're going to move on to the uh, notorious Leland Cypress. Um, is of course a large harbor tree across, across between the Alaska cedar and the Monterey cypress, um, but it has the flattened scales of its uh, Alaska cedar parent, but the um, the form of the Monterey cypress. Uh, it's it's very interesting combination of traits uh, from one from the two parent trees. Uh, its diamond shape you see here. Uh, is due to the, the type of branching it has. The branches connected these very, very tight V angles um, uh, and it give it this very distinctive shape, uh, at least when, it, you know, when it's not too, too old. Uh, it was discovered in a Welsh estate in the late 1800s. Uh, so it's been around a very long time, but it's often incorrectly planted in small spaces. It's often sold as a hedge tree and, um, you know, even here, this is on a campus, a uh, community college campus nearby here, uh, where they were given, they were, they were planted, you know, appropriately, but with they're also already kind of growing into the parking lot here. So they, they um, unless you have a really large piece of property, you know, they're, oh, they're almost always going to take up more space than anybody has, but um, it's probably the most uh, incorrectly planted of all conifers. Um, uh, And so here's a, an example of this. So this is a, a, a street not far from where I live. And you see that you have all these nice emerald green arbor varieties doing their job here, uh, nice and tidy, uh, uh, not taking up too much space. It's almost as if the housing developer, you know, they ran out and they just put some Leland cypresses here, but these poor people have no room left in their backyards. They've even sheared them at the top uh, at one time. But I mean, these are gonna grow right into the windows. Um, so at some point, something's got to give here. And here's an after picture. <laughs> and this is not an uncommon site around here anyway, where at some point you, the trees start growing, they're growing into a, like a public space. And these homeowners, you know, were probably, uh, you know, had to bear the expense of this very expensive pruning job. And uh, at some point we'll probably have to do the same on the other side because they, they virtually have no backyard. Um, so it is, um, a beautiful tree, really, but it's often planted incorrectly. And uh, but if we look at the foliage, we see how similar it is to the Alaska cedar, except it's very dark green. Sometimes it almost looks a little dark blue to me uh, in certain lighting. But it it the shape of it is for pure Camas cypress um, uh, with the X pattern and the the pointy apices. Uh, but the dark green is the color of the foliage of the Monterey cypress. Um, and it has this really beautiful rusty twigs for contrast. 
but uh, but you can see, you know, it, it's it's got a lot in common with the uh, Alaska cedar. It doesn't set many cones. They're larger than uh, uh, than the cones in uh, than the parent uh, than the Alaska cedar parent. Um, not quite as big as the modern ray cypress parent. Um, has uh, you know sort of small to moderate sized horns and uh, somewhat wavy edges. Um, but it's, it's, it's easy to identify the Leland Cypress by the form um, and the, the, you know, that, that type of the angle and the color of the twigs. Um, okay, now we're gonna move on to a beautiful tree, the incense cedar, which is native to, um, you start seeing it in uh, central Oregon actually, uh, and then much more so in Southern Oregon, California. Northern Baja and uh, a small area of Nevada in the Lake Tahoe region. Um, there are two other species in the genus native to the far east, but this is the only one we see in North America. Um, and it's very tolerant of heat, drought, and poor soil. And here in Portland, it's a very popular highway tree. It's planted up and down the sides of the highway where it seems to do fine and it seeds down. Um, when I'm stuck in traffic idling, I often see them growing all these little trees, clearly not planted, you know, growing in between the, the links of a chain link fence or up against a, a guardrail, you know, where they actually certainly uh, chose the spot. But um, so not only do they do well, <laughs> they'll actually seed down in some of the worst, most inhospitable places you could imagine for a tree. Um, and so if we look at the scales here, you see that how long they are, you know, compared with everything else we looked at. That's a defining characteristic of the incense cedar foliage that the scales are very, very long fluted looking and they're slightly pointed and they line up really quite perfectly in a row. And, and they don't have any stomata, stomata markings. Uh, I mean, you can see there's a few sprinkled around but they don't really have a presence in terms of you know, a visual presence but that you would notice uh, just looking at it as an identification feature. Um, and uh, the result is these beautiful, these beautiful sprays uh, of foliage, um, which in the winter set pollen cones right around holiday season. So the foliage of the incense cedar is very popular for, you know, um, garlands and wreaths and conifer bouquets that you see uh, in the holiday season because, uh, of course, all conifers are wind pollinated, and most of them, most of the ones in the cypress family, do pollinate in the winter, which is uh, a windy time of year. So it makes sense. Uh, but the incense cedar sets its cones the earliest, uh, you know, in the late fall, you know, early winter, just in time for the holiday uh, holiday season. Because there are many other conifers that set beautiful male pollen cones, but it just doesn't happen to be during the holiday season, you know, and, you know, when there aren't flowering plants to distract people. Um, and uh, it has these like uh, flower bud cones, kind of like, like tulips to me. Uh, and they age from this green to orange, I'm sorry, yellow to this caramel color. And this final stage is often described as looking like a duck bill. Um, but, but I think over here, they look like tulips. Uh, and they're a little bit longer than some of the others are an in, up to an inch long. And uh, the thing is, if you are trying to find a, a cone, they have the unusual habit of just dropping all their cones after seed release. So uh, you'll have to look on the ground. <laughs> um, but they often set so many cones that the whole tree will look tinged and yellow. It can be quite pretty. But they'll be there one day and then they'll all be gone. <laughs> and you'll have to look on the ground if you want to find one to make an identification. And uh, while the bark of most cypress species in, in the cypress family is very similar, um, not like the pine family where some bark is so distinctive uh, that it takes a right to species like, you know, ponderosa pine bark or lace, uh, lace bark pine, uh, it's usually not something helpful in identification, but there are a couple of exceptions. And the uh, incense cedar is one of them. As, as a young tree, it has this very shaggy and stringy bark, um, but then it doesn't take too long before it gets this gouged out look, like, like someone took like a woodworking tool and just kind of gouged it out. 
And then the old growth bark is very different yet again. It's uh, this bark, if you go up and touch it, it feel, feels almost as hard as wood. It feels very wood-like. Um, so it, it goes through uh, significant changes as it ages, you know, um, very, very beautiful, like sort of like rivers running together, you know. Um, the Theopsis delbrata, the stag cord cedar is, um, a beautiful conifer. It's theopsis means thuya like and um, is native to Japan. There's just one species in the genus, and where it grows in, in, in Japan is in forests similar to uh, the, where the Western red cedar grows here. It grows, Western red cedar grows here in uh, association with the uh, Western hemlock. And in Japan, uh, the staghorn cedar grows in uh, association with. Um, uh, I can't remember one of the two hemlocks that grow there. Uh, uh, and it has sort of an indistinct, indistinct shape um, that wouldn't necessarily be so easy to, to identify on a, on a drive by. This is a, a variegated version, but what it's known for, of course, is its foliage, which is so stunning and gives you an immediate identification. I was very pleased when we moved into this house um, about a year and a half ago, uh, there are four of these growing in the yard. I don't know what, uh, I think it's a cultivar, they're, they're smaller, but they have this incredibly beautiful foliage, which gives you your URD as soon as you flip over the foliage and you see this, you know what plant you're looking at. It, it has very wide scales and the stomata take full advantage of this surface area and just paint it with this beautiful chalk white. And the, the contrast with the green, uh, perimeter that's left there is is very beautiful um, and it has uh, it's the widest scales of all the scales um, it has this very the middle uh, the facial pair has a rounded apex and the uh, this lateral pair has a more of a, 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 a you know kind of a, a, a um, more pointy but a soft point you know so uh, you could uh, also ID this plant blindfold, it has a very, it feels like vinyl, it feels like plastic, a very pliable plastic. And these apices are so pronounced that, that you could you know, identify it by that as well. Um, I'm happy to say it seems to be getting more popular around here. It was one of these trees I learned about many years ago. And, um, and I'm glad to say that I'm starting to see it in the nurseries more because I think it's just an underused conifer. It's just, um, I mean, how, how beautiful would that look in, a, in some sort of arrangement of plants? And it has interesting seed cones too. They're rubbery, kind of rubbery, like a uh, same consistency as, you know, almost like a juniper berry while they're maturing with all this great uh, waxy uh, coating on them for deflecting uh, light, but they age into a, uh, a woody brown. Um, they do not stay rubbery uh, for the end of their life. I'm going to end with this last conifer here um, that we started with. Um, uh, here's just a different look at these magnificent conifers and one of the gravestones here dating from uh, 1902. And I just was interested here to see that they just don't put how, how many years the person lived, but how many months and how many days as well, which I guess back in those days, you counted every day because you, you never knew how long you would live. Um, but of course, these 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 form uh, perfect. Uh, they they grow incrementally into you know just these perfect perfect shapes. And what gives them their distinctive shape, of course, is that they have these parallel fronds that um, are parallel, kind of like the pages of a book. Uh, Plat actually means flat branch. Um, and uh, the species also has flat branch has a flat branch flat branch. But this the cultivar most of the cultivars typically take that to its logical conclusion of like pages in a book. Um, and as I said before, this used to be in Thuya. Uh, so it used to be um, considered a true arborvitae as is reflected by the uh, common name. And so there is just one genus in the species. And you see that the, the characteristics of the uh, well, ages is similar to, to Thuya, it's like, a, slightly pointed apices that you know sort of tend toward lining up but but only just a few scattered stomata so you can see how um 
it could be have thought to be in Thuya, but the Cohen's are really quite, quite different. Uh, they uh, are very quirky, delightful cones, and they usually set in great numbers on these flat branches, um, almost like a jester's hat. Uh, and they are coated when they're young with this a beautiful pottery uh, substance that reflects the light and, and like, allows them to show up really nicely. Uh, even in this small picture up here, you can see where they're reflecting light. Um, and each cone has a, a small almond shaped wingless seed that often stays behind in the cone um, after it opens. And uh, male pollen cones aren't typically, you know, thought of as uh, a decorative element in, in most conifers, but uh, this, uh, the Oriental Arbavati does set these beautiful little salmon um, pollen cones. If you see to my finger here, how really tiny they are, but they are just beautiful. And it's just one of the delights of uh, observing conifers in the winter, you know, on a beautiful, a beautiful winter day, just walking around, uh, you know, the Arboretum or wherever, if you live in an area where a lot are planted, you know, you just see, it's always something interesting to see. And I remember the first time I saw these salmon pollen cones, I was just so delighted because, you know, they, it was unexpected and it was winter and there were still so many things to discover with conifers. Um, oh, so I, I left, we got about five minutes for questions and uh, that's the end. So I stop sharing, I will stop sharing. Thanks, Elizabeth, that was fabulous. <laughs> I do have some questions in the queue. Um, bear with me here for a second while I figure out what where they went. <laughs> um, uh, somebody or asked early on about the X pattern. They weren't, I guess they weren't sure um, that they were seeing that. Can you go back to your slides? I'm sure. Sorry. I need to start, I'll have to share again. Okay. Yeah, sorry. I don't know, no worries. Just was, it was before the shearing slide, I think yeah. she asked it. It's all the way at the beginning, excuse me while I go back. Um, see, uh, if you follow the, the cursor, uh, do you Zoom quit unexpectedly? Uh-oh. Uh-uh, let me just X that out. Can you still see everything? I see, yep, your okay. slide, yep. So the X is, oh, I'm getting a message here. Right, X right there. Uh-oh. I think you just crashed, Elizabeth. I can see you, I can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. Okay. Uh, the X is here. Oh, I don't see your slides again. Oh, you don't see my slides. Oh, oh um, sorry. <laughs> Let me uh, hold on here. Go back up. Trying to escape out of this. How about now? Uh, yep, it's yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. The X is. Let me get my pointer. <laughs> um. Let me do a highlighter here. There's your X. Um, and so if you were to look, there it is again. It's harder to see on these because let's just go back to this one. So you got your X here, X here. X here, 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 here. So it's kind of an X with a little loop de doo on it, you know? Yep. Is that clearer? I think so. Okay. It's a little harder to see on the green ones. Yeah, it is. It's just, you know, and you have to definitely develop an eye for it, you know? Um, that's why this group of conifers is, is difficult, you know, because the, the differences between them is subtle, you know, um, but not, not so much in the cones, but in the foliage. The next question was, do you have any uh, new treatment recommendations for Alaskan cedar blight? Alaskan cedar, um, 
blight. Oh, I, I'm not know. I, maybe the person is thinking of the uh, the Berkman's blight. Um, for the uh, for this one, I'm not sh uh, aware of um, the Alaskan cedar having a, a blight, a, a fungal problem. Problem. Um, maybe I, they could, could clarify that question. Yeah. Okay. Um, are any of these plants good for zone five? Yes. Um, yes. Yes. Uh, let me just open this book here. <laughs> Actually, um, let me go. I have this. It's in the charts. So um, get to the chart screen. So uh, incense cedars zone five in the charts I have at the end of the uh, column, the zone for each that it's, it's most tolerant to the lowest zone that it's tolerant for. So uh, all of these, the only one that isn't tolerant to zone five is the uh, Leland Cypress, which is zone six. So uh, the, callus, the, the incense cedar is zone five down to five, the Fort Orford cedar is down to five, Alaska cedar four, Pinocchio Cypress four, um, Eastern white cedar, Two to three, so all of them except for that Leland Cypress, which is six. Um, yep, I think. Can you see grew, that? Can, can yep. you see how, how it is at the bottom there? Yep, I think we grew most of those things in Rochester, and that was a zone five. I think. Yeah. Lived there. Yeah. Cool. Um, lots of thank yous. A lot of worthwhile presentations. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. Excellent presentation, thank you. Great presentation, um, lots of information, new information. Yes, I know. <laughs> oh, do you know of any nursery selling the Port Orford cedar? I have a very hard time finding the Port. I've been on a hunt for Port Orford cedar for a long time. And I was even in Port Orford cedar country last winter and I couldn't find a nursery selling it. Um, there is a, um, around here, there's a, um, a native woodlands uh, group that has an annual plant sale that sells it. Um, but I have a very, I, I, can't, I wish I could have had a better answer for that. I, I, I've been probably gonna have to order because I would like to plant another one in my yard, um, order one online, um, but they're even hard to find online. And I don't know why they're so difficult to find, but. Um, yeah. Um, somebody's asking if they can get the this picture of your chart so um, they can look at that closer. Um, maybe you can send that to us and we can put it on the website. Um, well, the problem with all of these pictures is they're copyrighted by OSU now. Um, so uh, um, buy the book. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, the, I, yeah, the presentation can be available, but I, I don't know that I could be sending out individual. Pictures. OK, that's fine. Yeah. Everybody just go ahead and buy her book. <laughs> I know I am. I was fascinated. So yeah. And the charts, there's like 50 pages of charts like this for every group of conifers. So um yeah. all organized just like this. And this white thing here is the middle of the page. So they, they span two pages. That's what that is. Oh, perfect. In case you were wondering why there's a big white stripe right down in the middle. Um, somebody's like, oh, I already have the book. It's wonderful. Um, what's the book name again, please? Uh, native and ornamental conifers in the Pacific Northwest. Um, I think we feature an article from your book on the in the new conifer quarterly that should be coming out. In the yes, next it, it is. It's good. The articles on the true fir genus of uh, Apis. So yep. another difficult genus. <laughs> I, I saw it come. Uh, the proof of the conifer quarterly come through uh, Jeff's email a little bit ago. So. It's, it's on the way to the printer shortly. Yeah, I'm very excited. Yeah. Yeah, it looked good. Okay, anybody else have questions? The title of the book is also in the description of the lecture series. If you click on, the, go to the website and read through all the descriptions of the lectures. Awesome. Okay, I'm gonna stop the recording now.